three, how can we measure the rate of reaction? So these are lab-based techniques. How can we actually measure the rate of reaction in the lab? The first way we could do it is to look at a change in gas volume or a change in mass. Measuring the mass change, rate of reaction. 5 grams calcium carbonate, 20 mils hydrochloric acid, cotton wool balls to stop any splashing. You can see the mass down there. We're looking for the mass lost. Let's see what happens. Okay, hopefully we can see that the uh, some bubbling going on there and the mass seems to be decreasing. We could measure the decrease in mass over time to calculate a rate of reaction. I'm just going to give this a bit of a swirl. Alright, this one, slightly different. Perhaps I wanted to measure the volume produced, so I'm using a gas syringe here. The reaction will take place in the conical flask. I have some of my 10% hydrogen peroxide, which I diluted a little bit. I've got my manganese dioxide, which is the catalyst. And what will happen is the catalyst will break down the peroxide, it will form water and oxygen gas. I can measure the oxygen gas in my gas syringe set on zero at the moment and what I can do is I can take readings at different times to allow me to calculate the rate. Let's give it a go. Okay you can see the gas is being produced and I could take readings at different times allowing me to calculate the gas released and the reaction rate. So as like those videos demonstrated the reaction could produce a gas and that gas will ex escape as the reaction progresses. The two ways we could measure it is to measure the amount of gas produced using a gas syringe or we could look at the amount of mass lost. An important assumption here is that we assume the gas is not soluble in the solution. So if we are looking at collecting the gas, we can take measurements of volume at regular time intervals which allows us to determine the reaction rate. If we're measuring the change in mass, we also need to take recordings at certain times so we can determine the mass of the gas produced. Once we've done those two things, we then need to convert either the volume of gas or the mass lost to the corresponding concentration of the reactant so we can describe the rate as the change in concentration over the change in time. Technique to determine the rate of reaction might be to use a titration at a number of different time intervals. So the way you would do this is to have your experiment going and then extract small samples of the reaction mixture, usually with a pipette, so we would describe that as being an aliquot, at regular time intervals, and then to stop or slow the reaction so that we can determine how much is present. That process is called quenching, and quenching is usually achieved by adding ice cold water to slow down the reaction rate, or sometimes by adding other chemicals which completely inhibit the reaction. So we do our titration on our aliquot and that allows us to determine the concentration of a reactant at certain parts of the experiment. An example here is given below between hydrogen peroxide and acidified 
potassium iodide, where we're determining how much I2 is in the solution via a titration. Another way that we might look at measuring the reaction rate is to look at a change in gas pressure. We have available gas pressure sensors which allow us to measure the change in gas pressure in a closed system. Another important thing to consider about gases is that the volume and the temperature must be held constant if you're measuring the pressure because if those two things change it's going to change the value of the pressure. So we need to do it in a closed environment and we also need to use a water bath. An example of a calorimetry or light absorbance process is the reaction that's up now. Slightly different but similar. The final reaction is where we would predetermine a point where we stop the reaction. So this reaction takes place between sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid. At the moment I have my sodium thiosulfate in my beaker. It's a colourless solution and I've drawn a black cross at the bottom. Now our predetermined point where this reaction is complete is when we can no longer see that black cross. As soon as I add the acid to the thiosulfate we should get the reaction to occur. We will time the reaction to work out the reaction rate. Okay, the cross has disappeared and it's saying that it has taken 16.91 seconds, so that would be our reaction rate for this particular reaction. In that particular reaction I was using my eyes as my calorimeter, but again in a more sophisticated situation we could look at how much light can pass through different samples. So to use colorimetry and light absorbance, it's particularly useful when one of the reactants or products is colored. The color of the reaction mixture changes with time, and we use this colorimeter to determine the depth of the color in the mixture. So if we take out samples at certain times, we can then pass light through those samples. We can work out what is called the absorbance and we, what we know is the higher the absorbance, the greater the concentration. So an example of this would be using the purple permanganate ion, having it undergo a reaction to form the colourless Mn2+. And we could extract different samples at different times of the reaction. And if we pass light through each one of these samples, you can see that this one's going to absorb a lot of light, give us a very high concentration. This one here, virtually transparent, it's, going to, it's not going to absorb much light at all. We set up what we call a calibration curve and we could determine the concentration of each of those test tubes. And finally, another simple but effective way to determine or measure the reaction rate is a change in electrical conductivity. So how conductive is the solution? So if ions are produced or used during a reaction, the electrical conductivity of that solution begins to change. With a conductivity probe, we can measure the change in conductivity, and we can then plot that on a graph to show the change in concentrations of the species being produced or consumed. As in the case of the calorimeter, conductivity or conductility of data logger can be calibrated by measuring the conductivity of solutions with known concentrations and then using the calibration curve to determine the concentrations. So for instance here is that same reaction on the other page and we could determine the conductivity of this reaction due to the fact that we have a large number of moles of ions on the left 
and a small number of moles of ions on the right. So how would the conductivity of this reaction change over time? Well, the conductivity would get much smaller. Why? Because essentially we have 23 mole of charged particles on this side, CP, charged particles, and we only have 2 moles of charged particles on the product side. So the conductivity of this solution is going to decrease significantly of that, as that reaction progresses. So to finish off, some top tips for volume 3. If you need to do this in the lab or you're thinking about doing it for your IA, think about what is easiest to measure and easiest to convert to a concentration and make sure that after you've collected your data that you relate it directly to the concentration because after all the rate of reaction is defined as the changing concentration over time. Thanks for watching guys. Uh, finishing up day two of Wobonga. You can see some of the kids stuff in the background. Camps set up for tonight. Um, don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe if you're new and I'll see you next.